Hi everyone and welcome to the 12th Annual Forum of Women and Homelessness. Now the theme this year is Older Women Living on the Edge of Homelessness. Before we start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we and our presenters meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to Elders past and present. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, uh, this year has been all about change, as many of us have experienced. And uh, as you would know, this forum normally is live in Brisbane, but we've had to mix it up this year and uh, meet with the COVID restrictions, and we've now put it online. Now, that actually has opened up the door to the world. We've got uh, presenters from all over the world and all over Australia. And I know we've got a lot of people joining us from all over Australia as well. So Karen Lyon Reed is joining me, the CEO from the Lady Musgrave Trust. Good morning. Good morning, Lee. Now, a, a lot of work has gone into putting this together, yes. but there is a benefit, as in uh, we are reaching a lot more people here today. Yes, we are. Well, as you say, over 400 people attending today. Great. And we always have a lot of regulars that like to come along to our forums but we've got a lot more this year yeah. and they range from all kinds of organizations not-for-profit charities government entities from across Australia have yeah. joined us today right. um, a lot of the not-for-profit and, and homelessness sector is also um, joining us and they uh, um, give us great support mm -hmm. uh, we've got hospitals and university representatives and actually a lot of our Zonta friends have joined us today I know so a uh, big shout out to our Zonta friends and also our volunteers that normally come along to our physical event yes but um, but unfortunately can't be here so hi everybody that normally comes along to that we can still feel yeah. your presence though can't that's we? right yeah that's we're all right. in this together yeah. and uh, I think the response that you've had is indicative of the well it's homelessness week of yeah. how everyone is aware of what is going on and, and, mm. and really want to do something positive about it so the timing is perfect for this forum yes absolutely okay now uh, I did mention an impressive lineup of speakers and that is what we certainly do have and one from overseas as well and a few from uh, Melbourne now they are are in lockdown yes. as we know but they can still join us thanks to having this online That's which is right. wonderful but we've also got two very special launches today too so you're not going to want to miss that because you are going to be the first to hear about it and uh, know all about it right here mm -hmm. but uh, we'll keep that under wraps for just the moment what do you mm -hmm. think absolutely <laughs> okay keep it quiet keep it yeah. Now we do encourage you though to ask questions. We'll be asking questions as we go along yes. through the morning. Uh, but on the page that you're on, the YouTube page, they have a, a live chat section. So if you want to upload your question there and hopefully uh, we can address as many as possible. We are on a little bit of a schedule. I know we always say that when yes. it comes to conferences, but because we have people meeting us through Zoom and joining us through Zoom, they're in the waiting room and they do have other things on. So we do have to keep it moving. So we will try to address as many questions as possible. Fingers crossed we get to them, but uh, a list of all our presenters are on the program, which was emailed to everyone? Yes, it certainly was. Mm -hmm. So if you want any more information or um, surely uh, you can reach out to us also after the event if there is anything we didn't address. Mm -hmm. Sound fair? Sounds good. All right, okay. Um, now, what else have I got to get through? Oh, to do an event like today though, whether it's a conference live or whether it's what we're doing here, if you could look behind the scenes here, we have got uh, a cast of, I'm going to yes. say, Yes. 20, yes. 30, yes. easy. Mm -hmm. To do something like this, uh, you'd need funding. And yes. you, uh, it's just been amazing because it is a tough time out there. But when mm. you reach out mm. to your businesses, like minded businesses, they jump on board, which is amazing. They so certainly do. Well, we will be acknowledging a lot of our sponsors throughout the morning. I would like to firstly say Cromwell Property Group Foundation, uh, Eastern Star Foundation, you've got Zonta, who you mentioned, yes. Queensland Government, and Keystone Private. As I said, thank you so much for coming on board and enabling us to to do something a little different this yeah. morning. We're yeah. excited by it, so we hope you guys are too, and uh, wait till you see the lineup of, of people we've got today. Well, you know what? You're our first speaker. All right then. <laughs> so I think I'll hand it over to you so you can just okay. give us a little insight as to uh, what is actually going to happen yeah. here this morning. Okay, thanks, Lee. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Lee. Thank you for your continued um, participation in all of our work. Pleasure. Um, you're a great supporter of ours. And also, a big shout out today to the uh, Lucid Media Group who are here with us in the studio, surrounded by that group, and uh, to our content division friends. 
Uh, thanks for everything you've done so far for us. So a little bit about the Lady Musgrave Trust, just to get us started. For those of you that are new to the trust, uh, we're Queensland's oldest charity. And uh, we started 135 years ago this year, which is, seems like a long time ago, and it is. And uh, we provide three services primarily in the homelessness uh, sector, homelessness service for women and children. The first thing that we do is we provide accommodation and support services for young women up to the age of 30 um, and their children and we do that in partnership with our colleagues at Churches of Christ. The second service that we provide that many of you know about is we, we provide knowledge and education to women that are in crisis and we do that by producing our handy guides for homeless women and these are these two books here. One of them for Brisbane and one of them is regional. And many of you know that at these forums we always launch the updated version of our handy guides and so today here it is. So you can get online and order your um, updated version of the Handy Guide. I know everyone from Santa Care, Micah Projects, hospitals um, always order these. And for example, a nurse may give this out to a, a young woman that's been a victim of domestic violence. And it provides information on where to get help, where to get accommodation, um, support in general. The third thing that we do though is we provide um, this forum and this is all about building the capacity of the homelessness sector and getting us all to communicate and collaborate together in a better way. Which brings me to today's topic. So last year at the 2019 forum I announced that for the 2020 forum we were going to focus on older women living on the edge of homelessness. Now, as many of you know, we have been struck with this uh, incredible statistic from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, who are talking about a 31% increase in older women's homelessness, which is alarming. And so the Lady Musgrave Trust decided we are going to do something about that, hence why we're focusing on this topic today. And we're going to go f everywhere from discussing what's happened, what's brought us to this, to this crisis, uh, what's going on in the sector and, and, and across government in terms of solutions and also what's the Lady Musgrave Trust doing and we've got a lot of research and um, products to share with you today. So, so that's, that's really going to be the focus of the day. Um, so really, let's, uh, let's get cracking on with the program then, Lee. I know, and it's amazing, and you can see that uh, there's a lot of areas we are going to cover with exactly what you've just said. Mm. The work that you guys do is amazing, and we will learn and see a little bit more of that as we go through. And the statistics you've just said are quite staggering, that mm. they are increasing, especially in the older women, which is what we're focusing on yes. today. So what we're going to do now is uh, actually hear some stories, now some personal and very raw stories yes. from five ladies. We've got Maggie, Amanda, Dee, Diane and Liesl and uh, you know you sort of think well I'll never be in that situation. We'll just have a listen to these stories and see how easy it is to slip into that statistic we are talking about. So let's take a look at the video. Um, it was it's always been an, a, 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 an insecurity in myself that uh, the fear that they may sell and I can't find something and I, where would I be you know like I have a child to look after, where would I be living? So um, I always had that fear when I was in private rental, always. I, I, I love that I've got my own place, you know, um, and, and it feels quite secure. You know, I feel, um, I don't know, I feel like after all these years I've, I've, I've achieved something. For me, it feels great. I'm also really nervous because, you know, I'm hoping I can, um, my anticipation I'll work for another couple of years, even though I could retire now, um, because now I don't have the backup of my super. So once again, I feel, I feel secure, but insecure, if you can understand that. I ended up here because when I first moved in, I had, um, it was just me and my youngest son, who was five at the time, oh no, five, seven at the time. But we had 
I was living in a real dump because I had been living in a nice unit at New Farm with my partner and my our child. And um, he left in the middle of the night one night and left me with all the bills. Um, and so therefore I had nowhere to live because I couldn't afford to live there anymore. I moved into this really old, old house. Um, and when I say old, there were whole, big holes in the floorboards and everything, but it was all I could afford. Like the front stairs actually fell off and things like that. And it was so awful. Um, the view was great, but the house was falling down around us. It was the kind of house where I had to actually um, sleep with my son because um, there would be rats crawling on him at night. And I got one of the last units in one of the first buildings in Kelvin Grove. But even then yeah. it was a big fight because my old house was, I was paying like $175 rent and this place was 180. And they quibbled over the fact whether I would be able to afford the extra $5. I'd been married for 60, I think 66 years and I'd actually been um, in China um, for six months or nearly six months as an English teacher at a university over there and um, I came back to discover that my husband um, had used all the equity and everything we ever had. Um, it appears he was a gambler that I wasn't, I, I, I mean, I knew he bought the occasional lotto ticket, but I was not aware of the amount. And um, not long after I returned home from overseas, um, the, we got messages from the bank that the house was being repossessed and all sorts of things. So. Um, I mean, we, we'd had a, you know, a occasional rocky marriage, but it was uh, uh, completely out of the blue for me. Did you ever feel that you might have been homeless? Until that point, no. Until that point, and you know, we had um, reasonable assets, um, you know, but it was all gone. This uh, house was an opportunity presented to me when I uh, found myself without a job and um, the owner of the property I'd been renting previously for 25 years um, wanted to sell the house. So I lost my job and my home in the same week. I've never owned a home, no, no. Like I was never in a position to get a loan for a home really. I never earned enough money. And as a sole parent, um, I was never had assets really that I yeah. could use either. Yes. And yeah. I never got an inheritance or any bucket of money come yes. my way that yes. would have given me a, you know, a hand up into ownership. But I've never been really sure that I wanted to own my own home, mm. to be honest with you. I, you know, it would, I don't know. I, I've always, I've questioned really that kind of, um, that model that we have in Australia of home ownership being the only way you can have secure housing, mm. you know. Mm. Um, mm. I, I, I'm not sure that that's true necessarily and it shouldn't have to be true either. Mm. Um, I think it should be that we as citizens of a nation this wealthy with so few of us should be able to house our citizens really well in a range of models. We were renting a house in Emu Park in central Queensland yep, on yep. the coast. We were overlooking Great Keppel Island, absolutely gorgeous home. We were watching the whales breach from our back deck um, and we were going to stay there until we retired, at which point we were then going to, our plan was to buy a Winnebago or, you know, something like that so that we could travel. And then on the morning of the 8, uh, 19th of September 2013, I went downstairs at 10 past four in the morning and I found my husband on the kitchen floor. He had suffered a fatal heart attack. My world stopped and everything changed. Um, 
I couldn't afford the rent at the time on a part-time sal um, salary. However, because we knew the owners, fortunately, they reduced the rent from 500 a week to 250 a week for as long as I needed to stay there. I didn't want to take advantage of that, so I went anywhere where I thought, you know, a job would come up or, or I'd get a job that sounded interesting and it happened, the, the first one happened to be in Canberra. So I, off I went. I was working um, full time. I was living in an apartment in the mid, in Braddon in Canberra. It was great. I loved it. And then the company I was working for um, closed its doors. So <laughs> here I was trying to pay $400 a week for a one bedroom apartment and I, I didn't have a job. Fortunately, I did I got another job. It was only uh, temporary for six months. During that time, I, I then found another job in Narandra, so I moved out there. Um, and I was there for two years, and now I'm back here in Toowoomba because I've got family here, and, and now I want to settle here. But, you know, it, it's such a, um, it, it's, it's so unsteady. But for so much, so long, I, I, it was like being on a knife's edge. Wow, Karen. I mean, that just brings it to life. So you've got a 66-year-old lady. You've yeah. got a, a well, mum morning, of everybody. a seven-year-old uh, child. I mean, thank you, Lee. it's quite diverse who we're talking about here. It is. And, and those are just five stories of the many. And they're all varied and very complex. Yes, I, I think a lot of us think when it's homelessness, it means you're on the street already. Mm. No, mm. it's not that. There's not um, that. We're on the edge is what we're talking about here. And we're trying to get everyone off mm -hmm. the edge which is what the aim is today. Right. So we have got a wonderful lineup of speakers and uh, a lady who goes to bed every night at 8.30, I think the curfew is in, in Melbourne, is, jo no. <laughs> <laughs> is joining us now, the Honourable Dr Kay Patterson, AO of Age Discrimination Commissioner. And uh, Kay began her role as the Age Discrimination Commissioner back in 2016. Now her political career has always shown a strong interest in issues of effect, that issues affecting older people. So uh, we'd like to hear more from Kay now in Melbourne. It's over to you. Welcome, Kay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm in Melbourne in lockdown. Eight o'clock is when we have to go. Oh, to okay. it's, it's very eerie when there's no traffic outside and we're in lockdown. Yeah. And I would love to have been in Queensland for a whole lot of reasons. It's about eight degrees here today. It's freezing. Oh. I've shut some doors to try and keep the heat in my study. <laughs> and um, we've, we've got, um, it's very cold and I would love to be in Queensland. So I'm sorry that we've, I can't get up there to be all with you, but it's fantastic that it's meant that we're covering more people and seeing more people across Australia rather than just in Queensland. So I wish I could see you all, but I'm, it's tremendous that there are so many of you, and I'd like to thank the Lady Musgrove Trust and Karen Lloyd-Reed for inviting me to participate and to thank Lee for introducing me. As the Age Discrimination Commissioner, I've made it my priority to address three major manifestations of age discrimination. Elder abuse in the community, age discrimination in the workplace, and older women at risk of homelessness. Older women's risk of homelessness has been hidden and I want to acknowledge the work of the Lady Musgrave Trust over 135 years and congratulate all of those involved in the work of the Trust, the paid employees, the volunteers, the contribution organisations like the Dodger have made. It's tremendous to see a Trust being so involved in issues affecting women and particularly in the area of homelessness. The image of homelessness is often focused on people mostly men who are rough sleeping. Mm. However, there's a hidden cohort of older women who've led what we call conventional lives, yet find themselves at risk of homelessness as they approach or enter retirement. Some of them, though, can find themselves at risk of homelessness as early as in their 40s. My interest in this area stems from work I did some years ago with the Victorian government between retiring from politics and, and becoming commissioner. And I chaired a ministerial advisory committee looking at emerging groups of people experiencing homelessness. 
that was a very good experience because I was working with 17 high profile people in the area of homelessness and it's been an enormous benefit to me in this job, those connections and what I've learned. The two emerging groups were people uh, which we identified were young adults leaving out of home care and older women as the two key groups. Fairly much neglected 10 years ago, um, but two groups that were emerging quite significantly and very fast. In 2013, my local council, the Burundara City Council, in conjunction with Monash University, published a research paper, Local Government Research into a Hidden Issue. Based on local research during 2011 and 2012, the paper explored the experiences and issues that put single older women, 55 years and over, at risk of homelessness. This shone a light on the issue of older women who lack resources and support for secure housing. And this was very much hidden. And many of the women didn't see themselves at risk. So the booklet that's being launched today is the sort of booklet that those women needed to plan ahead and to think what might happen when they couldn't work, for example. Homelessness is a human rights issue. An adequate standard of living, including access to safe and secure housing, is a fundamental human right covered under Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In 2019, I released a paper, Older Women's Risk of Homelessness background paper, it can be found on the Human Rights Commission website. As Karen has mentioned, the number of, of older homeless women in Australia has increased by over 30% between 2011 and 2016. That's a staggering number between two census. Um, information being taken from two censuses. Not sure about the plural of census. We have an ageing population, a high cost of housing, and a significant gap in wealth accumulation between men and women across their lifetimes. This paper explores the risk factors behind older women's risk of homelessness. These include being single, renting, living alone, experiencing economic disadvantage, experiencing family and domestic violence, having a lack of financial support, a loss of a partner or a relationship breakdown, personal factors such as mental health issue, a history of abuse and having a lower level of education, experiencing a crisis such as a job loss, illness or eviction, or coming from a non-English speaking background or if, if the woman is Indigenous or Torres Strait Islander. For some women, a single crisis or a change in circumstances can result in homelessness with little or no warning. Whereas other women, for a combination of factors, so it may be one factor that tips them over the edge, or it might be a combination built up over many years, such as financial insecurity, the high cost of housing, or relationship breakdown. It may lead them to slip down the housing ladder over time. Some women, such as women with a disability, are also more likely to experience risk factors associated with homelessness. As the snapshot of this complex issue at the time the background paper was published, the average superannuation holdings of women were 157,000, contrasted with those of men, 270,000. 18% of single women, older women, were renting. 45% of these older women who are renting spent more than 30% of their income on rent. Two thirds of single women on the age pension who do not own their own home have less than $50,000 in assets. Older women made up 19% of social housing and 16% of community housing tenants. Systemic issues also affect older women's risk of homelessness and compound over time. For example, in February, 2020, the gender pay gap stands at 20.8% for the base salaries of men and women working full time. This includes superannuation, bonuses and other additional payments. Women are more likely to take time out of the workforce to work part time to raise children or care for a family, and many of them are in casual employment. They can experience difficulty getting work or re-entering the workforce or gaining work and income commensurate with their skills, experience or potential. The majority of women in the workforce work in fields associated with lower wages and casual employment, health care, social assistance, education and training and retail and hospitality. 
The paper then explores some ideas around next steps for reducing older women's risk of homelessness. Innovative solutions are needed to prevent older women becoming homeless. Without these, this problem will only continue to increase. The solutions must take into account the range of circumstances of the women in question, from their assets, their income and capacity to work, their age, through to their housing requirements and preferences, and too often their preferences are not taken into consideration. The aim must be to enhance women's housing and economic security across the remainder of their working lives and through retirement. While social and community housing are part of the answer, there is also a place for exploring potential solutions to reduce older women's risk of homelessness with a focus on preventative and innovative approaches that broaden the scope of affordable housing solutions beyond social and community housing. I'd like to encourage those of you today who are participating to be the champions of creative ideas about initiatives to address the needs of this cohort of women. While I am concerned about all older women who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, I have limits to my time and available resources. I have two staff and an EA. People say, could your department do something? And I think, well, my department's very small. So I'm focusing on preventative solutions to assist a cohort of women with some assets, but not sufficient to own their own home. My concern is that when these women lose their job, they run their assets down as they can't see any alternative. They can't see that the assets they have may be able to get them into some sort of accommodation. Developing practical solutions requires engagement across sectors from all levels of government, local, state and federal, the property industry, finance and business, superannuation industry, the not-for-profit sector, including community housing and philanthropy. As I've mentioned and we'll continue to discuss today, older women's risk of homelessness is generally hidden and this cohort often seems to fall between the stools. Most have never had any contact with Centrelink or housing services or other services and the booklet being released today will actually help people in that situation. Shared equity is one potential model I've been discussing with a range of stakeholders. Any older women who choose to participate in a scalable shared equity model, rather than risk that running down their assets, will not only go and gain housing security at the individual level, but also have the added broader community benefit of reducing the significant and ever increasing pressure on social and community housing. The aim would be for them to own sufficient equity in their home by the time they reach pension age that they can afford the rent on the portion they don't own and the costs associated with the portion they own. This, will, uh, this is only one cohort and one possible solution for them. There are many other cohorts and we ne must never forget the particular needs of women from non-English speaking backgrounds, indigenous women and rural and remote women. Different needs which require different solutions. Some exciting and creating developments exist and others are in the pipeline but we all need these and more. Moving on to the current challenging context facing us while data continues to emerge, COVID-19 is also adversely impacting housing security across all age groups. This includes the old women who were, even before the pandemic, renting in insecure employment with minimal of any superannuation and who were just one setback such as illness, job loss, addiction, or relationship breakdown away from at risk of being homeless. This is a serious issue. I'm focused on advocating that as part of the policy response to dealing with the pandemic, then moving towards the recovery phase, all levels of government, and I say all, businesses, not-for-profit sectors, work together to find innovative, flexible solutions to this very complex problem. This must be a priority area within the broader response to the pressures on homelessness and housing affordability being exacerbated by COVID-19. Older women's risk of homelessness was increasing before COVID-19 and no doubt this is being exacerbated by the pandemic. We need a reset switch to try some new and innovative policy, policy solutions. As I mentioned earlier, older women's risk of homelessness is a complex issue 
and requires a multitude of flexible solutions. I thank those of you participating today for your work in this area. You are well placed to be the change makers for all those Australian women who are relying on our advocacy, initiative, determination and compassion to assist every one of those women facing the risk of homelessness because every one of them is depending on each and every one of us. Thank you so much. And we'll now move on to hearing about the Lady Musgrove Trust 12 month research findings and older women's homelessness and launching the incredibly useful trust guides for older women. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kay. No, very informative. Very. Actually, Kay, um, one of the things I picked up from that is um, living on the edge, which is what we're speaking mm. about here, is to let people know that there, people like yourself and like us, we are there to help. We are all in this together. They're not alone. And uh, maybe tuning in today with that forum, they may feel that they can open up and actually ask these questions of yeah. where to go now. Do you feel that will help? No, I think not. that's absolutely important. I, I was involved in one uh, webinar yesterday, over 500 people enrolled, today over 400 people, maybe a few overlaps. I, I apologise to those who heard some of that yesterday. But one of the things that's heartened me is, and I think it's been one of the positives of COVID-19, yeah. that we've, I'm not sure we would have 400 people today at a gathering, or yesterday 500. We've had almost 1,000 people register that shows an incredible interest mm. in the area, which I think has increased in the last five to seven years since I first got involved um, in, in, in a, between my times as a senator and a, and a commissioner. Yeah. And I was also minister responsible for housing for some time nationally. It has increased. I think the numbers have increased, but also the interest has increased. Yeah. But we require... Um, a, a multitude of really exciting and interesting responses. We've got a, you've got in Brisbane, a um, community housing company, which has set up its own retirement village, the first one in Australia. How innovative is that? Yeah. It, almost on the, the doorstep of the CBD in Brisbane, there are exciting projects. I mentioned um, yesterday, what I thought we need is the hub that has all these examples of what councils are doing, what not-for-profits are doing, what Musgraves, Lady Musgrave Trust is doing, on a website so people can go, oh, we could do that, we could adapt that, we yeah. could do this. So mm. I want a bit of a mission because that idea <laughs> came to me yesterday. So I'm sure lots of people out there will have lots of other ideas and they could put those on the hub. Absolutely. Th Kay, thank you so much for your time this morning. We really do appreciate it. And um, I'm sure you've opened up ideas. We've yes. all opened up ideas. I think what we have learned through COVID is never say never. That's right. Because things can happen that we always thought were impossible. Mm -hmm. So never say never. Thank you so much, Kay. I'll be staying on to listen to the rest of it. So all thank right. you very much. <laughs> We'd love to have your company. That's great. Hey, uh, thank you everyone who is sending through comments. We really do appreciate that. We're getting very positive feedback. As yes. we said, it's a very new format of what we're doing this year. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we're thrilled that you are joining us, but also that you're enjoying uh, uh, being part of it so thank you so much for all the positive feedback in fact uh, we do take that a step further because you do each year when you run forums or anything the lady musgrave trust does you like to get feedback to improve That's to, right. to see what we can do mm. so at the end of this forum an email will be sent to everyone who registered mm -hmm. um, asking you to fill in the survey and and give us feedback on things you might like us to discuss, on uh, the format change, or did you like it this way? Should we That's keep it right. this way? Yeah. Um, yes, so there's lots of lots of things we take on board and only you can help us do that. So that will go out, what, at the end of the forum? End of the forum, yes, yeah. around 12 o'clock. Excellent. Yeah. So please make little notes as you're, as you're watching today and um, add yeah. to them because it's quite, it's, it'll only take a few seconds. It's a very That's easy right. survey, yeah. but uh, it does mean a lot when it comes to preparing for whatever the next event is and also the next forum next year. That's right. Yeah, yes. all right. Okay, well, we've got uh, another guest speaker joining us now. And uh, again, in Melbourne, <laughs> these guys certainly wouldn't be joining us on the desk here, no, would they? they wouldn't. So <laughs> it's great to have them, great to have their company. So Charlotte is joining us now. Now, Charlotte Dillon is the Senior Manager of Community Housing 
YWCA. Now, the majority of Charlotte's work in Korea has been in Aboriginal housing affairs in both Victoria and Northern Territory. And today, uh, Charlotte is going to be discussing our regional our housing needs in regional Australia. Um, and you can check out more information about Charlotte on the program, which you have all been emailed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, good morning, Charlotte, and thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so thank you to Karen and the team for having me and hosting the forum. Have we got the, the slides up now? Yes, yeah, so we'll keep working the slides with you and uh, away you go. Yeah, great. So as mentioned, I work for YWCA Housing, which is a subsidiary of YWCA Australia. So YWCA is a national feminist organisation focused on improving gender equality for women, young women and girls. Uh, we advocate for increased access to safe and affordable housing options for women. So the women's housing needs in regional Australia research report was released on 20th of May this year, and it was jointly funded by YWCA National Housing and the Commonwealth Department of Infrastructure, Regional Development and Cities through the Build a Better, Reg Building Better Regions Fund. Uh, the survey was national across all states and territories it included over a thousand participants, including 300 women from regional and rural Queensland. So there's a lot more information in the report than what I'll provide in this presentation. So if anyone would like to discuss the specific methodology or detailed findings, I'll provide the contact details to Susan Rudlin, our head of research and evaluation. Um, it's also important to note that the research was conducted in late 2019. So we expect that the natural disasters of 2020, the bushfires, floods and COVID-19 has added to financial and housing challenges for many women in regional Australia. Um, now, while many of us are aware of the housing stress faced by women, what the research highlighted is the prevalence and experiences of women in regional Australia. So one in eight women reported being homeless in the past five years and one in four women hid their homelessness from others. So women have always traditionally been the caregivers and looked after others. So when it comes to instability in housing, they felt ashamed and that it was a reflection on their inability to look after themselves and therefore didn't want anyone to know. And homelessness is often hidden. So women's homelessness is characterised by overcrowding, couch surfing, living in temporary accommodation with friends and relatives and moving in and out of unsuitable properties. It's not your typical rough sleeping on the streets. Um, the research showed that many regional women are being locked out of the private housing market, with one in four having lived in temporary accommodation in the last five years because they couldn't afford private accommodation. So it is really common and women are worrying about it happening to them. We can see that we saw one in five women personally knew at least one other woman who was currently homeless, and more than half of the women worried that they could become homeless. The, the research shone a light on the financial challenges in regional Australia. So the high cost of living and increased cost of housing means that many women were going without in order to pay bills for their housing costs. So you can see that 87% of women were carrying some level of financial stress and 78% were worrying about having enough money in retirement. Uh, the next statistic concerned me the most. So we saw 76% worried about having enough money to meet all of their expenses. The research identified that women are foregoing necessities to pay housing costs. So in the past 12 months, a significant proportion, it was 44% of women had refrained from heating or cooling their home. 33% had gone without medical treatments and 31% refrained from using transport. 41% had asked for financial help from family or friends in the past 12 months and 30% had gone without meals to meet their rental mortgage payments in the past 12 months. Now, the financial challenges and, and stress about housing costs does have its flow on effects. So we can see that women use a number of strategies to meet their housing costs. They pawn or sell possessions, uh, sell assets, or take on a secondary job and pursue an additional income stream. Uh, what we found was that nearly one in five had accessed emergency food relief in the past 12 months to free up money to pay their um, housing costs. Um, so now if we focus on the responses just from older women, 
the research shows that they are the least likely to say they need help from an organisation that helps women in housing stress. So what we found is that there's a desire for independence. And older women who are stressed about their housing situation have a really strong desire to navigate their housing challenges independently and reported feeling ashamed if they have to rely on children or family for housing. And that ties in with what I mentioned earlier around older women throughout their lives being the caregivers, but then um, through no fault of their own or from other additional circumstances, end up in these situations where the roles are reversed. Uh, the research showed that older women are more likely to move to a more remote or regional location to reduce housing stress. And then what this does is it presents a real risk of isolation. So the drive for self-sufficiency is leading older women to move further away from their family and friends to be able to afford housing. We found that there was a third of baby boomers, so over 55s, who are in facing housing stress, moved to a more remote or regional location to reduce the stress. So that was a total of 31% compared to 21% of Gen Xs and 17% of Gen Ys. Um, so women's housing potential and incomes are capped and they often have limited savings or superannuation. Uh, the report really highlighted a trend of fear and uncertainty um, among the women. So because their earning potential and incomes are capped, older women who feel insecure in their housing situation are fearful about the future. So as they're picturing the future, they recognise that there may be few options for better housing, particularly if their current housing situation is, unsafe, is unsuitable. And then the perceived shame of unstable housing and the desire for independence is unfortunately placing women over 55 as the fastest growing age group of homeless people in the country. Um, now, despite the overrepresentation of older women in homelessness, women are really positive about the future and they're clear on what they need and how they can see how their lives would be improved if they had more access to appropriate housing. So we asked women what affordable housing would improve for them and three quarters said that their mental and emotional health would improve. Uh, two thirds said that they'll have a stronger sense of security and almost half said that they'll have improved physical health and feelings of safety. Um, so what I've really taken away from the report is essentially that housing matters, uh, safe, affordable, suitable housing plays a really key role in women's quality of life, physical and mental health and safety. Um, so where to from here for all of us? Um, we all know kind of what needs to be done. Uh, more funding to develop targeted affordable housing across regional Australia, including ageing in place. Uh, we can support recovery and economic stimulus through investment in social and community housing in regional communities. Um, the community housing sector, it's a really small player in the housing market and has limited funds compared to the private sector. So we need to start exploring innovative partnerships with the private sector to increase the supply of affordable housing. Uh, here in Victoria, we partnered with an aged care provider to refurbish one of their decommissioned aged care homes into medium to long-term accommodation units for older women um, that were at risk of homelessness. Um, so that brings it to the end of my presentation. I'm not too sure if we have, if we have time for questions or... Well, no, fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, just listening to what you were saying with uh, ladies trying to meet, so, so the financial, one of the biggest financial strains seems to be rent. And you're saying, you know, they move to, uh, you're talking regional Queensland anyway, uh, they're yeah. moving even more remote and the isolation. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, I see what they're helping financially, but um, they, they can't do that on their own. We're learning this with COVID, you know, when we have had no personal interaction, we struggle. Uh, that's such an important role and important yeah. part of survival, isn't it? Mm. Yep, so they, they essentially end up isolating themselves. They lose their personal connections with their families, the supportive community. Um, we know that in a lot of the regional areas, some of the services that are available in the more metropolitan regions are not available. Um, so that's when we see deterioration in people's um, not just physical health but mental health.
Yeah, and I think we're all learning uh, mental health plays such a, it's such a predominant part in our world yes. at present that we have to be very mindful of. So, uh, Charlotte, yes. thank you so much for joining us this morning, yes. all the way from Melbourne. Uh, we've got a few presenters from yes. Melbourne, so it's great that you can be part of our forum. And uh, thank you so much for the information, especially about regional housing here in Queensland. No worries. Thank you. Thanks for your time. See you guys. Bye. Thanks, Charlotte. All right, now uh, we actually have a, a special message mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to listen to now from the Assistant Manager, Mani Minister, I'll get that right, oh, try again, Assistant Minister for <laughs> Community Housing, Homelessness and Community Services, and that's the Honourable Luke Howarth MP, and of course uh, he is in Canberra, is that where we're getting this message? No, from? he's in Brisbane, yes. He's there in Brisbane, go. but a very busy man. Yes. So uh, he has taken time out from his day to uh, send a special message to all of us today. So how about we have a, a look at that now? Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Lee, for today's event. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on lands in which we are all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the invited guests in today's forum, including the Age Discrimination Commissioner, the Honourable Dr. Kay Patterson AO, and the Minister for Housing and Public Works here in Queensland, the Honourable Mick De Brenny MP. Thank you, Karen, uh, for your kind invitation to join this forum. This year, of course, the Lady Musgrave Trust celebrates some 135 years of service to women and children in Queensland, which is just amazing. By any measure, that is a great achievement. And I'd like to thank and commend you for the, your efforts and for your continued support of women and children here in Queensland. It's very appropriate that today's forum is taking place in Homelessness Week which raises awareness of the extent of homelessness in Australia and the complexity of the issues involved. And as your Federal Assistant Minister for Community Housing, Homelessness and Community Services, I opened Homelessness Week on Monday, and I'm very invested in helping homeless people become housed and be supported in stable accommodation. I'd also like to congratulate you, the Lady Musgrave Trust, on the handy guide for older women, which we're launching today. I've got a copy of it right here, which I've uh, had a good look through. And I think this will be invaluable to women in need with the different support services that is listed there. Life is about relationships and for women and children in need, uh, the relationships that they'll be able to build from people who are willing and able to support in this guide it is, is essential. Under the Federal Government's National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, uh, we prioritise women and children affected by domestic violence. And the Morrison Government is very committed to helping these women and children be safe and get back on their feet. We've got our Safe Places Emergency Accommodation Program, which will shortly be announced uh, by myself or the Minister for Families and Social Services, the Honourable Senator Anne Rustin, where you'll see $60 million worth of new, safe, secure housing delivered throughout Australia and different states to support women in need. It also involves $18 million worth of funding from the Morrison government to help upgrade homes for women and children uh, to make sure they're safe in their own home. The government's emergency and food relief and mental health programs further support people who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and, and prevents many more people becoming homeless each year. We're investing some $200 million uh, in emergency relief services, including budgeting assistance to help women manage their finance, and of course, emergency food relief. And the people that deliver those funds for us, for us both here in Queensland and around Australia, uh, provide an invaluable service. In May this year, the government also committed 
over $48 million to the National Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan to provide added support for mental health services during the present pandemic. Uh, our Health Minister, the Honourable Greg Hunt, obviously is being overwhelmed at the moment with, uh, with dealing with the response to this medical pandemic, which has also turned into an economic pandemic. And this mental health support for people that are in lockdown or have been unable to operate their business and to those most uh, at risk will be invaluable during this time. Homelessness, of course, during this National Homelessness Week is a complex issue. As I mentioned before, it could involve mental health, its breakdown in families and relationships. There's so many different factors that cause people to become homeless and it can happen to people at any time. We've also seen uh, an increasing trend in homelessness for women aged 55 and over, which is quite concerning. Numbers rose by 31% back in 2011. There was over 5,200 women who were, who were older, over 55. Uh, and at the last census in 2016, that rose to over 6,800 women. So the government's aware of it. I know that the state ministers are as well. And I want to thank you for the work you're doing to help people in this category uh, who find themselves homeless. The figures showed around 28% of older women experiencing homelessness stay temporarily in other households, which involves couch surfing or living in their cars or vans. And another 28% live in severely crowded dwellings, which is the fastest growing area of homelessness. Most people, and some people even watching this today, we think of rough sleepers, women that are sleeping on the street. Uh, we, of course, do think of couch surfing, where many people take in women and children and they sleep in their living rooms and so forth. But severely overcrowded dwellings is certainly a big increase in homelessness that both the national government and all state and territories need to focus on. It's a big issue here in Queensland. And I've spoken with Mick De Brenny in a bipartisan way to try and address that. We're also addressing boarding houses, which is another area of homelessness as well. And Mick's committed to riding the boarding houses with me in a bipartisan way to address that area of homelessness. As we know, many older women hide their homelessness from family and friends and feel ashamed of their homelessness. And this week in National Homelessness Week, it's about breaking that stigma. There's no need to be ashamed and feel free to, they, women should feel free to let their family and friends know what's happening, uh, as well as their representatives and people in this book, which you've written, uh, that are willing and able to reach out and help them. The state and territory governments who obviously have prime responsibilities day to day around housing and homelessness and have own and operate all the social housing stock uh, and give authority to community housing providers to also help in this sector. Have programs targeted to provide safe, affordable and sustainable housing for health and well-being of women and vulnerable Australians. Through the Morrison government, $6 billion annually, we support uh, homelessness outcomes not through the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement, but also through the over $4.6 billion a year we put into Commonwealth rent assistance to help women in the private rental market have secure accommodation there as well. Homelessness, as I said, can affect anyone at any time. And as I said before, it's not just rough sleepers. It's all the different categories that we spoke about around boarding houses, severely overcrowded, couch surfing, and even supported accommodation, which it can be often temporary for a short period of time. When access to safe and secure housing is not available, it can impact a person's health, you know, their, their physical health, their employment opportunities, which is obviously an issue at the moment with the coronavirus and we're finding more people 
unemployed through four shutdowns of businesses and uh, of course their relationships with families. Forums like this and the work of the Lady Musgrave Trust is invaluable in helping these people. You provide valuable assistance and support to women who find themselves in this situation. I again commend you on the work that you're doing and the continued work that you'll do into the future. Thank you uh, for everything you're doing. Thank you to the Minister. It's on the radar. I mean, homelessness yes. is on everyone's radar. Yeah. Um, now it's a matter of us all working together and hmm. get, squash those numbers, you know, get, get those numbers down. Absolutely. And of course, um, people, very generous sponsors and corporate people uh, helping us out today. And one in particular is the, uh, the Cromwell um, Group. Yes, the Cromwell and Property Foundation. Absolutely. And they were a catalyst for this whole project of the Lady Musgrave Trust. If they hadn't have worked with us, we wouldn't have started this whole project and we wouldn't be delivering this new project and, and handy guide. So um, thank you, Cromwell Property Group Foundation. They focus on mature aged Australians um, as, as, a, as a focus. So we had great synergies with them. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, well, that's what you need. You go with an idea and they put yeah. their hand up and say, yep, yeah, we're on board, let's do yeah, it, which right. is fantastic. So why don't we hear a little bit more about the work that they do do? I've got Paul Wayman, the CEO of Cromwell, joining us with a special message. Hello, I'm Paul Wayman, the CEO of Cromwell Property Group and chairman of the Cromwell Property Group Foundation. Cromwell Property Group is an ASX 200 listed real estate investor and manager with operations on three continents. The Cromwell Property Group Foundation is an initiative of Cromwell Property Group that was started in 2014 to provide uh, some uh, benefit to our stakeholders in the community. We have a board that's focused very much on uh, recognising initiatives that provide tangible direct benefits with 100% of funds donated uh, to direct assistance uh, in identifiable ways to people who will benefit from them. We were very happy to provide assistance to the initiative proposed by the Lady Musgrave Trust. The Lady Musgrave Trust is Queensland's oldest charity. It was established in 1885. It's 134 years old. And it started with Lady Musgrave going down to the shores of Brisbane and meeting all of the migrant ships and she would literally gather up all the young servant girls that were being cast off the ships and she'd give them accommodation and training and that's what started the Lady Musgrave Trust. Now we're looking at servicing 10,000 homeless women across Queensland. One of the, the fastest growing groups of homeless people are mature age women. In part this is because of the economic disadvantages we see between the genders. In part, it's because of the rising tide of domestic violence. But we see as a group that this um, part of the homeless community is one um, that can benefit from the initiative because of the direct actions proposed by the Lady Musgrove Trust. There's an incredible sadness right now with older women in Queensland, and they are the fastest growing homelessness area, 31% increase in older women's homelessness since the la between the last two census. Cromwell Foundation has given us an amazing grant so we can research what are the issues that these women want and we can pool together all of the resources that they need and put them in a one-stop shop so they can resolve their circumstances in a much better way. We see as a group that this um, part of the homeless community is one um, that can benefit from the initiative because of the direct actions proposed by the Lady Musgrave Trust. Very impressed by the quality of the presentation, the commitment to raise funds in partnership with Cromwell Property Group Foundation and the objectives uh, and the fixed goals that the initiative identified over the period in which Cromwell Property Group Foundation will be providing assistance. So as I say, we're here to make a difference. We're here to help people and to be able to provide tangible assistance in a direct way to achieve tangible benefits uh, is very satisfying and rewarding.
Yeah, thanks to Paul mm. from the uh, Cromwell Property, Property Group Foundation for yep. uh, coming on board and, mm -hmm. and helping us be here today, which Absolutely. it's all about. Okay, now, I did mention earlier, we have two very special launches today, and you know what? Now it's time to uh, do one of those launches right now. It's a new product or a tool, you could say, and uh, it is a handy guide uh, to our growing number of homeless women. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of research that has gone into this, and we will learn a little bit more about that very shortly. But firstly, uh, thank you to the Queensland Government for playing an important role in homelessness. So uh, taking time out of his very busy portfolio, uh, the Honourable Minister Mick de Brenny, Minister for Housing and Public Works, Minister for Digital Technology, Minister for Sport, decent portfolio there, yes. has taken time out of his busy day to uh, send us a message. Look, his goal is to help make the lives of all Queenslanders simply better. And I think that's a perfect message mm. of what we're trying to do here today as well. So uh, let's cross to a very special message from the Minister. Hi everyone and thank you for inviting me to address you via video today. I apologise that I can't be joining you live this morning but I hope today's forum is a success. I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from where you are joining us today. I pay my respects to our Elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge the board, uh, all of the leadership and the staff of the Trust, and of course your CEO, Karen Lyon-Reed, and everyone joining in today for this online forum. Now, as Minister responsible for the delivery of housing and homelessness services, it's a great pleasure to work with organisations like the Trust. Uh, and it's great because we share the same fundamental vision, that every Queenslander has a right to safe, secure, and sustainable places to call home. Queenslanders who are experiencing homelessness or housing stress often have complex needs and complex challenges. So while we all wanna see the number of people who are sleeping rough reduced, of course, we all know that there isn't a single solution though. There's no silver bullet that will end homelessness. What's required is a sophisticated, innovative, diverse and person-centered response. And that's certainly the case when it comes to tackling the rising number of older women who are experiencing homelessness. And when it comes to determining the causes of homelessness for women and older women in particular, I think they're often related to the ongoing inequality women face in today's society. Women often face more insecurity in the workforce and with their finances. Women are still paid far less than men. Women still receive less superannuation than men. Women still aren't afforded the same opportunities to progress in the workforce and their male counterparts. They're these issues though aren't new uh, and they aren't getting better though, uh, certainly not fast enough. But the Palaszczuk government is committed to addressing these causes of homelessness for women and committed to addressing them at their source. Our Queensland Women's Strategy aims to tackle the gender pay gap, the financial literacy and capability of women, the retirement income gap as well. It aims to tackle the disparity of women and men's participation in high paying fields of study and the recognition of domestic work and traditionally female dominated industries. So if you haven't already, I'd encourage you to check out the Queensland Women's Strategy for yourself. But of course, there are women right now that are experiencing homelessness in Queensland. And the Palaszczuk government is committed to working with the sector and industry to support older women so that they can have a safe place to call home. And I wanna commend the trust and their hard work uh, for their hard work developing the Handy Guide for Older Women. You know, when I first became Minister for Housing, one of the first things I read was the Handy Guide for Homeless Women. It's an important document providing that one-stop shop for all information that women experiencing homelessness need. And now with a special version for older women, the Trust and its supporters can be very, very proud of your work because it will save lives. It will support older women. And our government has been hard at work as well, developing and implementing new support and services for older women facing homelessness. In particular, as part of our COVID-19 response, we moved quickly to provide people sleeping rough with temporary accommodation. And because of that effort, working in close partnership with the sector, we have supported over 50 women experiencing domestic and family violence into crisis accommodation during that period, as part of over two and a half thousand people we've supported. That's helping women like Let's call her Sarah. Sarah comes from a culturally and linguistically diverse background. She's had a history of depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. She had been experiencing housing instability for many, many years. And in April of this year, she came looking for housing assistance to escape a violent relationship.
And through our COVID-19 response, she was quickly helped into crisis accommodation. From there, we worked with Brisbane DV Service and helped her plan for her future. Now, she's living in public housing, in a safe location, and working with DV and health service providers to get her life back on track. They are the sort of stories that are being made in Queensland every day. And it is this Labor government that is committed to saving lives and providing more housing support for older women. But as I outlined earlier, it's a complicated problem, it needs a sophisticated solution. That's why under the Queensland Housing Strategy, we have been rolling out new programs and initiatives to support older women. Like in Mackay and on the Sunshine Coast, we're piloting the Better Together housing model. This model is supporting women over 55 who are looking to share private rental properties. The women are supported to have choices about how to manage their housing needs, to age in place in their own community and make positive social connections. In the southeast of Queensland and in Townsville, we have launched the Next Step Home program to support women on parole as well. Uh, this program recognises that women leaving correctional or custodial arrangements are at a really high risk of homelessness, in particular Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. This service though works with groups like Sisters Inside and the Queensland Corrective Services uh, Agency to support women on parole, to support them with their housing needs and help end that cycle of homelessness and recidivism. And since the pilot has uh, launched in 2017, we've supported more than 150 women into safe accommodation. That's 150 women that have been prevented from entering into homelessness and prevented from entering or re-entering the corrective services system. And we believe that government has a central role to play in delivery of housing support services just like that one. It's a belief the government, the Palaszczuk government, will never walk away from. And of course, there's still more work to be done. And so as we transition into the next stage of our housing action plan, it will take all of us working together to achieve that shared vision. So can I say this? Can I say thank you for allowing me to address you today? I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum. Well, thank you so much to the Minister, yes, for launching this very special guide. 111 pages of help here. It's not just a phone directory, it's actually a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Karen, I think you're probably, probably the best person to give us a little bit more information about what the guide is all about. Great, Leah, I'd love to do that. Well, hello everybody again. So yes, this is the Handy Guide for Older Women. This is a project that we did start um, a year ago now. It's an 18 month um, project. And I think we've got a couple of slides we can refer to for, for this session. So um, we, have, we have actually launched the project last year um, and it's called Ending Homelessness for Older Women. And um, we actually undertook this whole project in three stages after that formal launch. The first stage was that it was all revolving around research, really. And so we commenced um, two parts of a research project. The first one being around the whole issue of, well, what's going on out there? So we got um, some great consultants in, and they did a lot of um, survey, uh, consultation with key government and organization groups and, and have put together what is the backbone of this booklet. And Jenny and Rachel are going to talk a little bit about that research um, shortly. The second part of the research, though, involves our actual our, our, our property portfolio, which we have spread throughout Brisbane and Ipswich. So we've partnered with our um, our sector partners, Churches of Christ, and we're running a pilot program to look at what are the benefits of co-locating older women with our younger women clients. And we're hoping to see some, some uh, mentoring go on, some cross-sector, or cross-fertilization um, of knowledge and understanding of how to live in a com community and the environment. And, um, but unfortunately, that's been delayed a little bit. We, we already have the older women in, in the apartments, but it's been delayed a little bit because the COVID virus has, um, has made everything a little bit more difficult to, um, for, for these women to have contact with each other, which was the whole purpose. So we will, we will provide that to you when we have the, have the report ready. So the second part of the whole um, project was really around the development of the tools. And that's where this handy guide for older women comes in. 
So this booklet is produced for women that are affected by, by homelessness or not even quite yet. We're trying to get this book out into the hands of, of women before they are in trouble. And so what we're doing is we're spreading the word and we'd like you to help spread, us, spread that word as well. You can go to our new um, website. It's called www.thehandyguide.com.au and you can see on that website this handy guide which is available for order and um, um, we'd love you to order it and get it out into the community for us. And we're really um, working closely with the Zonta ladies across Southeast Queensland to get this into the communities. We want to get it to the RSLs, the local hairdresser, etc. Also go to the website, we're launching the new website which is, um, which is um, as I've said, the, the handyguide.com.au and uh, women themselves that are in need can, can, can get the booklet from there and get the information. The last part of this project though is important and that's the community-wide message. So we're running a major campaign across Southeast Queensland with billboards, radio announcements, um, and, and press releases, and you'll see that unfolding over the coming four weeks um, that gets the message out there because we want those women that don't know they're in danger of homelessness to become aware and to know where they can go to get help. So that's our focus, and uh, that's what we're going to be um, unpacking now with Jenny and Rachel. Well, it is time to uh, see how it all came together because uh, there was a dynamic duo that spent many, many hours and actually put pen to paper and they're joining us now, the dynamic duo. I, I love that. Rachel Watson is the director of Watson & Associates and Jenny Clark, director of the Lady Musgrave Trust. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. And um, one of the things I am going to, I know you're going to explain how it all got together. I love how you got out there in the field. You didn't sit behind a desk and make phone calls. You actually got out there and it, it opened your eyes and it's going to open our eyes too. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Lou. I hope we can live up to uh, an introduction calling you the calling us the dynamic <laughs> duo. We'll do our best. Uh, it is really great to be here today and to be part of this um, this project. And a special thanks to all of you that have tuned in today. It's um, it's been a long haul of online engagement for many people, and uh, we just feel very privileged that we've got so many people um, listening to this today and engaging and supporting this message and to be a little little part of a movement which feels like it's growing around Australia of concern and action to reduce homelessness in older women. Of course, enormously satisfying to see the guide for formally launched in its first edition. Um, today we're going to talk to you a little bit about um, the background to the guide, the research that, uh, that went into it, and some of this area has been a little bit covered, but we've taken it from the angle of understanding the research in terms of how it informs the, the uh, development of information resources like the guide. We'll also sort of explain how it's a bit different from a service directory, it's got other layers and it particularly stresses um, education, information, empowerment um, and making a plan and we're also going to talk just a little bit about the next steps. So Rachel from Watson and Associates uh, has really been responsible for all of the background work and really informing the shape and the nature of the guide as it was developed. So I'll hand over to Rachel for a little bit more information on that. Thanks Jenny. So we know that older women's housing is a topical issue. Everyone can tell a story about an older woman they know, they've read about, or is some, somehow in their world. But seeking out the answers for these women prove to be a lot more difficult. And although we've heard about them, where are they? These women generally are not accessing the existing service system. Um, they're often independent, and, and they can't imagine asking for help. So we applied a design thinking approach to the project, gathering information and reviewing this against real voices and advice by seeking representatives from the service sector to be our critical friends for the project. This group was invaluable in providing feedback, advice um, and reality checking the results of our consultations. Um, many, many thanks to this group of experts. It might seem that we tried to engage too much uh, for the development of a simple information guide. 
uh, but this is an important topic and we wanted to ensure that we gained as much information to inform the trust on the most effective way to catalogue and disseminate housing information to older women. At the risk of stating the obvious, older women are a very diverse group. Uh, from those who have been in and out of homelessness throughout their lives, have rented privately, have had secure housing until the loss of a partner or employment, have lived in subsidised housing, uh, to, women, to women who suddenly encounter homelessness in their 60s and 70s. We conducted an online survey as part of the project um, in the research phase. And the survey told us that over half the respondents were aged 50 to 67 years, with 25% responding from their own experience and the remaining 75% reporting having witnessed homelessness with family and friends, sorry, with family and friends or were working in the homelessness service system. Only a quarter of the survey respondents indicated that they had a personal experience of the issue. However, deep analysis indicated that many women did not identify themselves as homeless despite describing circumstances such as losing a home being in the process of buying a camper van or moving in with children and house sitting. The key findings of the survey were that 99% of respondents said it was difficult or very difficult for older women to source housing, primarily due to cost. 40% 40 40 of respondents identified unique information sources used by older women, especially the importance of family and friends and Centrelink. Other than these sources, respondents reported a very diverse range of other information channels, including community groups, housing organisations, churches, service clubs and RSL clubs. Not surprisingly, respondents called for information to be available in a variety of forms, including telephone lines, websites, radio and other advertising. We interviewed key leaders from a variety of related agencies, including Tenants Queensland, Brisbane Housing Company, Council of the Aging, United Care Queensland, Sundale, Sisters in Business, the Centre for Women and the Women's Property Initiative. Their feedback was consistent, uh, that the issues for older women were well hidden and difficult to identify. We also spoke to a number of government departments, including the Office of Seniors, the Office of Women and the Department of Housing and Public Works. The Department of Housing and Public Works has oversight of the regulation of manufactured homes and caravan parks. Once again, the feedback was that women, particularly more than men, were difficult to reach and despite best efforts, information did not necessarily reach them. We also put our boots on the ground and from Waco to Sandgate to the Gold Coast and visited a variety of older women's housing products, targeting properties that were priced to be affordable for women on low incomes. Site visits were conducted to three retirement living complexes, two over 50s developments, and a variety of manufactured home parks. It was surprising to see the quality and the diversity of what was available. I had my own personally entrenched views that these were products that were of low quality, expensive, and targeted to vulnerability. So I was deeply challenged by the visits, and I emerged as a true believer that over 50s housing was a viable option for many. The growth of homelessness for older women reached national prominence with the release in 2018 of the Retiring into Poverty Report, produced by a consortium of organisations around Australia. The report identified the growth in single older women, the lower incomes of women, less workforce participation by women, longer life expectancies, higher housing costs, women returning from living overseas, and a growth in women who have never experienced homelessness before. Other literature reviewed had similar themes. Overall, our research highlighted that there is a very broad awareness and concern about this growing issue, but generally very challenging to identify these women, perhaps due to their feelings of shame and failure, plus their invisibility in the existing service system. There is a widespread lack of knowledge about both housing and non-housing options available to older women, and Jenny will go into more detail about this. When you consolidate it all together, it became even more obvious that the handy guide to be, needed to be less directory and more engagement for older women. Thanks, Rachel. Um, at this stage, we, we thought that perhaps um, at the risk of stating the obvious, particularly to most of our audience, we needed to introduce a product warning with the guide. Um, and no, this won't be harmful to your health, but the product warning is really to say that the guide in itself, of course, will not create housing. It won't build housing. 
it won't make more housing instantly affordable to women. It's not designed to do that. It's designed to be an information uh, resource to help lift people's understanding and awareness and, and, and increase um, their awareness in moving out into the community and exploring options that are available to them. That, of course, is no, also no, uh, no reason why uh, action isn't needed and it continues to be needed by all of us in our organisations and as individuals to be good advocates for this issue, to be lobbying um, for a system, a housing system in Australia that works better for everyone, this group uh, included. So you may be wondering how the Handy Guide for Older Women is different from the existing guide. The information of the Older Women's Guide is complementary to the existing guide, which is a comprehensive list of services and supports for women. And that is the point of divergence. The Older Women's Guide is not just a directory of information. It does have specific services for older women, but we have shaped it to be a booklet that engages women to read, to think, to reflect, and then to act. It can be used on an individual basis to help women gain knowledge and take control of charting their own future housing path. So the two main content areas in the guide are, are obviously housing and housing options, but they're also about non-housing things, and that's where we start in the guide. Our research and engagement suggested that a, a wide range of triggers um, can result in women either having immediate or longer term housing vulnerability, especially loss of a partner and loss of employment. We also that know that many women facing housing uh, insecurity may be, this may be the first time in their life they've ever had to reach out and look to services and other support to help them through this stage. So that's why our guide starts with non-housing issues and addresses um, things such as financial issues, superannuation, legal issues, work and training, counselling, wellbeing and self-care, pet steps, pets, stuff and moving, often big impediments that women have to even considering uh, alternatives that may work better for them, support centres and carer support. Then we move on to housing options, and Rachel touched on some of these uh, earlier on. It's also uh, at this stage stating the obvious that there isn't enough affordable housing around Australia, and so the search for somewhere safe, secure affo and affordable to live is a difficult one. Most people know about home ownership and about private rental, and many people in the community do know about social and community and affordable housing forms. And the guide looks at, at these. But in addition to that, and for older women, there are a number of housing forms that are really worth looking at. Uh, some of these are formalised housing forms and some of these are the way older, older women themselves are seeking out creative lifestyles in retirement. Starting with over 50s housing, a very broad generic term encompassing a wide range of locations and standards and levels of affordability. Not well understood and indeed often actively avoided uh, in, 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 a, in a covering sort of response of I'd never live in a place like that. Our advice in the guide is to suspend judgment until you understand how these types of developments are structured and you have a look at a few, and particularly that you understand that these, these developments are structured differently from the forms of housing such as owning a home or renting a home that people might be more familiar with. Here in Queensland, but also in other parts of Australia, these forms generally fit into three categories, retirement villages, aged rentals and manufactured homes parks. You often can't tell at all by looking at a development what category uh, the development is actually in, le in legally. And each of those uh, styles of housing is um, covered by different legislation, state-based legislation, which will have a big impact on the terms of, of those housing, the initial and the ongoing costs, 
and the likely um, residual amounts that may be available if you choose to leave, uh, to leave that housing. We also looked at a wide range of uh, perhaps more adventurous options that older women are, are choosing. This was the area that, uh, that I found uh, the most confronting. I must say I, I came to this project thinking that living long term in a caravan, especially as a grey nomad, was not really a suitable option for older women and I was well and truly put in my place by a number of assertive older women who uh, who are strong advocates, particularly of, of grey nomad lifestyles. Uh, it's a community that is not well understood broadly in Australia, but it is one which uh, is, is nonetheless a community in its own right, supportive, informative of its, uh, of its members. Similar communities exist uh, amongst people living in caravans, emerging communities of people looking at tiny houses, Boat dwellers are also a, a group that, that, um, that fit into this category and, and house sitters and we did hear the voice of women who are choosing house, house sitting as a post-retirement uh, lifestyle option. We also visit a number of home sharing options, either women um, seeking to uh, attract people to come and stay in their home, either short term or longer term. Uh, looking at sh existing shared households, and there's a number of Facebook sites um, that are that are promoting the availability of uh, home shared arrangements. And thirdly, and most interestingly, um, work happening. And here in Queensland, we've got a particular project happening that is looking to encourage women to meet up and with a view to meeting other women who they feel that they are compatible and can share housing with. We also look at secondary dwellings, granny flats, they're called various things around Australia and reverse mortgage. All of these options have pros and cons and it's understanding those pros and cons that can make you an informed uh, consumer. So the guide helps women understand and start to explore these options available to them. So for women who use this guide, our advice would be take your time. Read, breathe, think, grab a cup of tea or an adult beverage, put it down, revisit the guide. <laughs> do your homework. What do you need to investigate? What do you already know? What information will help you? Find friends for the journey. Who will give you wise counsel? Who will make it fun? Who will challenge you? Acknowledge your emotional responses. You will at times not know. And you may be anxious or you may be stressed. This is totally normal um, because you are moving into uncharted waters. Make a plan and make a plan that works for you. Make a plan that you can action. And finally, plan the plan and make the plan create a journey for, of housing that's going to give you a great outcome. So our next stage is really looking at some dedicated uh, workshops um, focused on workers and volunteers who are working in organisations that support older women and also workshops for women themselves. The um, initial group will be the, uh, the workers and sector workers and that's particularly to increase worker knowledge around specific housing options for older women, develop an understanding of the pros and cons of these options, um, develop uh, and present a, an individualised planning tool, and also to develop a greater awareness of self-help um, processes and structures that the sector can be, can be most involved in encouraging older women to form and, uh, and develop. Karen, I think that's about it from us. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jenny. You. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Um, so as you've heard, there's a training program that uh, 
that we're now offering to both professionals and um, to women in need. So the professionals, um, if you want to sign up for that, you can go to our, our website, our normal website. For women in need, and if you know of an auntie or a grandma that needs some help and coaching along on this handy guide, they can go to thehandyguide.com.au and you can also order a booklet for them, yeah. which, is, which is key yeah. um, to the whole thing. No, yeah. that was, it was very, very interesting and the research, it, it does open our eyes up to a lot of things. I think the theme of today, Living on the Edge, is what this is about because it's reaching family, friends and workers, yes. but we're hopefully, they're on the edge, they can hand this to someone and they won't go over the edge. That's the whole idea. This is, this is what you've put together here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not just, as you said, phone numbers and that, there are questions you are asking. So it's a journey. The book itself is a journey. Absolutely, and about um, women be able to take control and so they don't end up in a crisis and yeah. highly stressful situation yeah. and they can um, follow a journey. Yeah, yeah. And, have a and friends and family, you have a role to play in this too yes, because absolutely. if you're aware that someone you know is on the edge, yeah. this is your chance to uh, grab the book and, and help them and work as a team, as you said. We need yeah. to collaborate. We need to be a, a family. We need to look out for our sisters. That's, it. That's what we're doing. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, ladies. Thank that you. was very informative. And uh, I hear that a few of you are now going to go as grey nomads. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole new world out there, isn't it? It's setting sail. Oh, no. <laughs> well, um, and then let's get back to our very wonderful sponsors, because without them, uh, the ones we're going to focus on now, mm -hmm. now they're new to your family. Family. They are. They've joined our um, our project and the Lady Musgrave Trust in um, January, February, and um, it's the Eastern Star Foundation. And we wouldn't have got this far with this project had we not had their help. And they focus mostly on. Um, um, mature age women's issues, uh, particularly around health and financial issues. Yeah. So yeah. So Very relevant to what we're talking absolutely. about here. All right, so Jonathan Nantes is the chairman of Eastern Star Foundation and uh, he has a message for us now. The Eastern Star Foundation is a philanthropical foundation which has a history of supporting the age dating back to 1954. The organisation was first established by members of the Order of the Eastern Star that operated an age and community care business in Bay Desert uh, until 2018. Last year we came, became known as the Eastern Star Foundation. The Eastern Star Foundation provides grants, funding to charity to help improve outcomes for the age. Our support focuses on evidence-based program and initiatives to help older people to remain independent, practice choice, participate in their community, have a support network and experience healthy ageing. And we looked up and we got a resume that the Lady Musgrave uh, Trust gives support to elderly women and, uh, and to help their families in time of need and distress and uh, disadvantage. The grant to Lady Musgrave Trust will help them to launch their Ending Homelessness for Older Women project, which will give at-risk and homeless older women the tools they need to know where to go to get help. And as we know that the numbers are increasing, we've got 10,000 of recent and it's not going to decrease, it's going to increase. And that's what our, our object is, is to help the ages homeless. Now Mick De Brenny, I liked what he was saying, Karen, earlier, mm. when uh, he was saying, Homelessness is a complicated problem but needs a sophisticated solution. Mm -hmm. Now you, in your research, found a lady over in London who I think, you know, pretty well has a sophisticated solution. Mm -hmm. Her name's Maria. How did mm -hmm. all this come about? Mm -hmm. Yes, she sure does have um, a great solution. Well, I uh, found out about the project she's been involved in and her long history of researching this. And she's a woman that's got projects off the ground. And uh, so I had a great discussion with her. And um, it, you'll see a snippet of that interview now, but uh, we do have the longer interview available online. And uh, it talks about site selection, what the women did, how they all participated in the project. 
Yeah. Fantastic. No, it would have been very, mm. and uh, cutting it down to 10 minutes would have been very hard. It so was. The yes. whole forum you're seeing today is online at the end um, for if you want to share it with other people, but also you'll see the full interview as yeah. we just mentioned. So this is Maria Brenton and uh, she is in London and she's the ambassador of the UK Co-Housing Network and trustee of the UK Housing Trust. Now she does a lot of research and you, you may hear that in this snippet yeah. uh, with communities in Holland, Denmark, Sweden, Germany, Italy, and the USA. And she's established the New Ground Co-Housing Community with the Older Women's Co-Housing Group. And at the end of 2016, this became the UK's first and only senior co-housing community to date. So let's have a look at your interview. So Maria, thanks so much for joining us today. It's great to have you as part of the forum. Um, now I know you've been involved and on the ground working on the on the housing project, and it's just a great opportunity for us to talk to you about the process and and everything that was involved. So to begin with, can you just give us an idea of how the model actually operates? Well, it's um, a cluster of 25 apartments around shared space, like a common room, a laundry, a guest room, a, a lovely big garden, etc. Mm -hmm. And um, 26 women are living there. And it's a very modern, age-proofed, friendly, light, airy building, um, which was only completed at the end of 2016. So they've been living in it just under four years. Now, the, the difference that I, um, I mean, it's had eight architectural awards, right? So it's a really nice building. The group participated in designing it with the architects, mm -hmm. which is one of the features of co-housing. Um, when people come to see the building, I generally point to them, them to the social architecture rather than the physical, because what makes this distinctive as a development and very different from almost all the um, other provisions for older people in this country is that it is run entirely by the group of women themselves. Mm. So they manage the building, they manage their own community, they take the decisions together by consensus. Um, and um, yeah, they've got a, a good age range, mm -hmm. which was designed in, they've got an age range of about 36 years. So we call them intergenerational. So the youngest is about 55 and the young, the oldest is 92 mm -hmm. next week. Oh, fantastic. So I'm, what I'm building up for you, I hope, is a, a sort of a mixed kind of community of women. Um, two thirds of them have bought their flats and one third are renting them with subsidized rents. Okay. And that's um, so how does that work of, then? That 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 subsidized rent model, the whole funding operation. How did how did that work? Well, we originally um, funded it through a um, a gift from a charity um, who wanted us to succeed as the first senior uh, co housing community in the UK, and um, the. The, the eight flats that exist on a subsidized rental basis have a, have, have a landlord. In our um, setup, we have housing associations who kind of like are the intermediary between the, the state and public money and the individual. So there's a small landlord for the eight flats. Um, actually, they don't figure very much. Um, they come and do repairs and things for those eight flats, but that's about it. Mm. The whole place is run and managed by the group yeah. and the the renters themselves are um, women who couldn't afford to buy um, and um, that's the only distinction that there is with them really I mean there's no distinction in the group they have as much right to make decisions as anybody else and you actually can't tell the difference there is no difference the no. chief asset of the building is the fact that <clears throat> you can come there and you can spend the rest of your life there you don't have to move out because it doesn't um, accommodate you getting old. It is totally age-proofed and wheelchair-friendly. Um, and uh, I can't, I mean, <clears throat> I can imagine that if 
probably some people will get demented. If people get demented, they may have to move out. But actually, it's a very safe environment for them as well, because there's only one access to the whole building. And all you have to do is put a keypad on that. And somebody who's confused and wandering would be quite safe. So what about how was the project set up initially and, and how long did it take you to do it? Um, it started from work that I did as an academic in Holland. On, I was researching um, co-housing that was um, developed by the Dutch over the last three decades. The, the Dutch have had a, a much more active, proactive approach to an aging society than we have here in England. Um, already in the 70s and 80s, they were asking 50 year olds, how did they want their old age to be? Because there are going to be many more of you. We weren't asking that question here. The Dutch government, successive Dutch governments, encouraged the development of these, what they call living groups, because they reckoned it was a better way for older people to live. Um, and that it would keep them happier and more active and healthier and therefore reduce their, their demands on health and social care budgets. So I went over to look at that and I brought the model over from Holland, I set up a workshop in London for women from all the different women's networks. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a group of them went away and became Ouch, the older women's co-housing group. They, <clears throat> they decided that they, they'd been talking about it, uh, as so many women do, um, but never get around to it. They decided they would do it. And I helped them. I mean, I raised money to come up and help them. I was living in Wales at the time. And um, it took us a very long time because we didn't have the recognition factor that you have in, had in Holland. Nobody knew what co-housing is, was among older people. And there wasn't an infrastructure of support for them. So because we were, the group was very intent that it wanted to be inclusive of women who didn't have enough money to buy their own places, we also needed a housing association. And I think we went through about eight. And they were kind of interested for five minutes and then lost interest. Um, we got f something like three or four sites in London. We lost each of them because... Um, land is very difficult here and expensive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I mean, it was took a very long time, uh, but it, I'm hopeful that that isn't going to be repeated because we have um, paved the way now for other groups. Mm. In fact, I'm working with another group who are, have learned an enormous amount from what we did mm -hmm. and will accelerate the process. And there's a lot more support and recognition of the benefits of co-housing now because of what we've done. Yeah. and because of the film we made and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We were lucky in the sense that we found a housing association who said, right, we'll, we will front fund it for you and we will develop it for you, yeah. which they did. And we are eternally grateful for them, to them. They um, bought a piece of land for us, which, I mean, we chose the piece of land. They bought it. Um, they, they, they let us choose the architects. Uh, they let us participate in the design we were represented, I and another person sat on the project management board all the way through the construction and supervised the construction to an extent. Um, so the group didn't have to part with any money except for give deposits at a certain crucial stage mm. when, when they needed, the, the housing association needed the security of tying us in that we wouldn't all just leave them with an empty building. <laughs> mm. Um, and also to improve cash flow. Yeah. So both of you then, that owned put your money in at that point then, did you? Or did you pull um, the group put 10% um, deposits of oh. the cost of their flats, each individual. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of 2016, they bought their flats from the housing association. And the small landlord bought eight flats from the housing association with the help of this charitable grant that we got. Ah, fantastic. They've, they've customized them in their own way. They had, uh, they had some choice about colors and did they want this kind of kitchen or that kind of kitchen? Mm -hmm. Did they want that kind of bathroom or this kind of bathroom? Mm -hmm. um, so they had some choice in the beginning, but you can't give a group like that too much choice because um, it would just get too costly. Yes. Uh, when, I, when I go into individual flats, they're all very different, very different, very much sort of, um, 
advertising the character and the personality of their of the person who lives there they had all committed to a set of core values like mutual respect cooperating um, working against ageism not setting up any hierarchy looking after the environment um, integrating with the locality that kind of thing so those are the key core values which they revisit every year together actually um, but you can be off from that be as different as anything and there's there they are very different in the group well Maria thank you so much for uh, sharing that with with our audience and uh, and being honest about the journey and the path you took and congratulations on your work because you really were the backbone to this to this whole project and and uh, and congratulations to everybody all the all the women that are living so successfully together now as a result of all that initial work that's not an easy thing to pull off so uh, you've done very well, the real well. The real test will be whether we pull the next one off and That's I'm working it. That's it. Okay, <laughs> so good luck with your conference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Well. Greetings to everybody. <laughs>
The first option that we looked at, as you'll see on the next slide, is we did look at a shared ownership model. Um, for women's property initiatives, that didn't quite stack up because if a woman owns even part of um, a home, she's not eligible for Commonwealth rental assistance. And for it to stack up for women's property initiatives, WPI, as the community housing organisation, we clearly needed to put um, quite a mini bit of money into it as well, which was some debt. And so we needed to be able to service that debt. So we needed a model where the woman could pay an affordable um, rent, being no more than 30% of her household income, but that she could also access Commonwealth rental assistance. So the model we came up with and that we're piloting is where the women um, will loan WPI $150,000 WPI sources all of the rest of the, of the um, amount that is required, but there's a loan agreement with the woman and she enters into a residential tenancy lease. But when she needs to, wants to move out of that property, she gets the full amount of her loan back, which is quite different to some of the retirement villages out there, plus um, the reserve bank interest rate, plus 25 basis points. So she's actually preserving the money that she has. She's not getting capital gain, but the preservation of the money that um, she has saved throughout her lifetime is still there. So just the next slide shows you um, a very brief, uh, sorry, not very brief, shows you an architectural drawing of the, the units that we'll be delivering in Beaconsfield. Um, the next one shows you the plan, the layout. So they're actually four single story units. Um, There'll be one two bedroom flexible, so the second bedroom can be used as a study or it can be used as a bedroom for the grandchildren or whatever. Um, we have planning approval, we've tended for the builder, we've um, engaged the builder, some work has started on site, um, and construction, depending on what happens down here in Victoria, will be starting very soon. Unfortunately, it's taken an incredibly long time for us to get this project off the ground. Part of it was the model that we ended up having, deciding to go with being the loan model. That took quite a bit of time for us to work that through with our lawyers. The planning approval also took quite some time. It's not a controversial plan, but unfortunately objectors um, put up objections no matter what. Uh, it's concerned about parties, concerned about um, uh, air conditioned units, on top of the seal, on top of the roofs that weren't going to be there, so it just had to go back to council a few times. So it delayed it a bit, but we are almost there. But the thing with this model, as you'll see from the next slide, is that it's not about the built form necessarily. It's really about a financial model. So it can be used in the inner urban and in apartments, or it could be used in regional areas and for a single property. So it really is around providing a model, a way of saying, well, some women who have some assets, this is the way they could use that money in a variety of built forms. Um, what it's doing is taking away that uncertainty and unaffordability of the private rental market that so many of them are, are finding themselves in and depleting their savings in. So um, the, some financial modelling advice that we got from uh, a financial advisor with a superannuation fund, he actually told us that if the women left their money in their super fund for 10 years and continued to live in the private rental market, after 10 years, they will have depleted that to about $35,000. This is talking in Melbourne where the rental prices are quite high. So then they'd be eligible for social housing. So it's actually a model that requires less subsidy than full social housing. Um, it's a preventative model and during that full 10 years, the women are living in safe, secure housing and have got rid of that stress of wondering where their next house is going to be and are they going to deplete their savings to the extent that they potentially will become homeless. So as you can see from the next model, we, we, next slide, we would like to scale this up. We've talked to the Department of Treasury and Finance about this as a model um, and we're continuing to talk to them. We really hope that government will see it as an option for women who are in this cohort, older women in this cohort, as a preventative model, um, one that is much more cost effective for the government. At the moment, this model is fully philanthropically funded um, and obviously debt borrowing source, debt, debt finance as well from WPI. Um, and the last slide is really just the wonderful um, philanthropic organisations who are supporting us with this project. 
Okay, we've got to wrap up, but it's interesting when you do put it out there and, and uh, so many people are keen to support, which is what you've just said, what businesses helped and came on board. Oh, yes, yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a number of um, organisations, philanthropy, you know, it's getting a lot more profile. When we first, you know, did our research back in 2013, and I'm thinking, you know, seven years on, um, but it's really getting out there as a, as a real issue. And I suppose the fact that um, the statistics are showing how much is increasing, you know, the ABS, ABS census from 2011 to 2016 yeah. showed that women's homelessness increased um, by 30%. In Victoria, it was 67% that it increased oh, by. Wow. So it's, you know, it is getting the profile out there. People are saying, what can we do? Um, and yes, who, you know, the organisations that have supported us is fan it's fantastic because we will have a clear demonstration model to go to government and go, here you go. And we, yeah. you know, we were even funded to do the evaluation, which is well, terrific. Well, that's, that's right. You'll have a working product that you can show everyone. They'll know mm. exactly what to expect and uh, what mm. costs are involved. Jeanette, thank you so much for joining us. Stay with Pleasure. us because we are going to do a little bit of a Q&A at the end. So thank you for your time yep. this morning. That's OK. Thanks but, for inviting me. You're welcome. Very impressive looking building too, I must say. Um, all right, now we live in a tech world and today is a perfect example of that. I mean, everything is very, very tech. So our next speaker is actually looking at that, high touch versus high tech. So I've got Professor Melissa Bull joining me, sitting right beside me, Director of Centre of Justice at QUT. And uh, we're going to be preventing homelessness amongst mature women. More in a tech world though, so welcome Melissa. Thank you very much. I just want to start with uh, the first slide, which is to introduce you to uh, the team that I'm working with. I'm working with a group of people from the uh, Behavioural Ec Economics and um, Society and Technology Centre at QUT. You can see there's a huge number of people on this list and that's because this is a complex problem that needs a range of experts expertise. What isn't on there is some of our community our partners, which is Mission Australia, Q Shelter, Tenancy Queensland, PwC and Queensland Department of Housing who funded this. And then aside from that, aside from our formal partners, part of this project has been engaging with a large number of community organisations, advocacy groups, and it's actually one of the really exciting and positive aspects of this, the generosity of those who acknowledge that this is a, a big problem and an important problem and are prepared to work with us in terms of co-designing. So what's this project about? And the next slide just is a quick snapshot about that. Um, it's a project about preventing homelessness amongst older women. Um, I don't really need to repeat it. You've heard how this is the fastest growing group. It's invisible. Uh, services actually struggle to respond to their needs because often they have some assets so they don't meet that critical uh, um, you know, uh, crisis group. They're often first time homelessness. And even more than that, they don't even realise themselves that they're vulnerable. So this is why we're trying to focus on prevention and primary prevention so that we can actually respond to the needs of this group before the women reach that crisis point. Now this isn't to suggest that we need to shift away uh, and take anything away from those other services that currently exist but in order to ease the burden for women, for services and for government, we have to think about responding earlier in the continuum. If you think that, you know, a, a crisis or some kind of change of circumstance happens and women might be dealing with that. They might go to their banks to change address or change their superannuation or, or change their insurance and it's at this point, or they are seeing, uh, getting some other advice, it's at this point what we call early responders, so not to be confused with first responders like police and emergency services, but early responders, those people in agencies, might be able to pick up the red flags and actually uh, provide women with information or diversion or some kind of support that can actually stop them going down that path. The other important element of this is that we take a multi, what we call a multi-channel approach. So some of this might be high touch, that's engagement with actual physical services, but some of it might be high tech. And the research actually shows that, you know, some of the challenges are that, you know, it can be stigmatising, um, it can, you know, women's families don't even know 
that uh, they're in this circumstance. Uh, so having a multi-challenge approach. Now, most programs don't, that deal with homelessness um, don't focus on prevention. Uh, and many programs use a mix of high touch and high tech approaches we're not wanting to reinvent the wheel. And as I said, we're le leveraging off other services and resources that exist, like the fabulous uh, uh, Lady Musgrave handbook and the services that they provide. Um, we share our knowledge and expertise, and, but it's likely for prevention that the high tech solution is going to be really important. Um, this is important too because the women that we're dealing with, the research suggests that they engage with social media quite a lot, so there's an opportunity there. Of course, we're not making the assumption that everyone will have the same levels of uh, digital literacy, so some, that's something else we need to take into account. So this uh, final slide uh, really gives us a look, a snapshot, a, um, a, a, an overview of what the project looks like. So you can see at the top that there's a change of circumstance. It might be a loss of job, a loss of partner, some other thing that's caused some kind of tenancy stress. And there's two, two courses into this. The woman might come into contact with what we call an early responder through um, SMS, email or some live chat and they explain their circumstances and they'll be uh, directed to a smart portal which will be able to connect them with the types of services that are tailored to that specific woman's need. Over on the side you can see that there are a series of like personas, they represent the diversity amongst women um, that might fall into this category, different levels of, of risk. Uh, the other path into this is a woman might experience a change of circumstance and she gets online, starts you know, um, Googling, asking questions through Google. We're looking to develop a smart system so that she starts to be connected, which is empowering women. So what we're doing in this early stage of the project is working with uh, uh, financial institutions, um, super, um, insurance, banking, so that they might work with us to co-design how we can develop um, a product or something that will work effectively with women. And that's basically our project. It's about preventing homelessness by empowering women to find and secure, uh, secure tenancies. I think it's fantastic. I, 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 we've been talking about you know, the families and friends and social workers and so forth. You're, you're bringing in a whole new area of, of bankers, of real estate people that are hearing uh, questions asked that should go, oh, I wonder if, if, even if it's just handing the book out, but uh, helping them, seeing the early signs and let's, let's, they're on the edge, let's bring them back over and help them. And I must say, we were speaking earlier off air, um, you know, I, I Googled, so I was looking for a rug. Well, I tell you what, everything on my feed at present is about <laughs> rugs. So if they can do that, surely we can do something here. I love the whole concept. Thank I think you. it's wonderful. Great work. Yeah, it's a very exciting pro project. And the thing that really um, inspires me is the interest and the enthusiasm and the recognition that this is such an important issue that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Let's use the tech world to our advantage. Well done. Thank you, Melissa. Well, you're Thanks. staying here on the panel too because uh, well, I have got a little question I'd like to ask everyone at the end. But I did mention earlier we have two launches today and it is time for that second launch to uh, happen. Now, it's an Australian first, so you're seeing it here. But to tell us more about it, uh, please welcome to our desk the only male on our panel at present, Michael Eels, partner at Business Models, Inc. And welcome. Thanks, Lee. Pleasure to be here. I'm just going to jump straight into it if I can ask for the slides to come up. So I'm here to talk about the Queensland Housing Action Lab and why. Queensland's housing and homelessness sector is in flux. We've been talking about all the challenges and while not for the want of incredible organisations and individuals working tirelessly to address the challenges surrounding housing and homelessness issues, in particular homelessness and at-risk older women, we must work together like never before to explore the different approaches to many challenges. So where can we go deeper here? The urgency to take collective action is amplified by COVID-19, increasing pressure on our systems and structures to identify and address the increasingly volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous health and economic risks. Despite this pressure, COVID-19 provides the opportunity to reset, reimagine and restart our systems and structures and even create new ones. 
To do this, we need to find solutions as complex as us, the people. And this is not a linear challenge, as there is no one-size-fits-all solution. We need an approach that actively probes, and probes the problem spaces and explores in collaboration with both incumbent actors and outliers to the systems to allow for new and novel ideas to be found. Moreover, we need to be open to new ideas and opportunities and go back to first principles to explore these problem spaces with a beginner's mind, one that is willing to reframe the issues we see and explore beyond the boundaries set by sector experts and leaders that have focused the frames of reference that have got us to where we are today. So next slide. To do this, we need to create the space where housing solutions of tomorrow can be designed, where a forward-looking process for developing and evaluating new concepts is embraced. In this space, we acknowledge conventional problem solving just doesn't cut it, and we need to adopt a designer's mindset, embrace multidisciplinary teams, and take a systemic design approach that will help us understand, ideate, and solve for the problems of tomorrow as much as the problems we're experiencing today. This space leverages a proven design toolkit that will help us pinpoint where in our systems we can intervene for the most impact while embracing the complexity and designing for the networks and interactions of the people within the housing and homelessness sector. Next slide. So embracing this is all about bringing the Queensland Housing Action Lab to life. The lab brings together sector leaders and outliers to explore the most pressing housing and homelessness issues. With the backing of Q Shelter and Business Model Zinc, the Housing Action Lab leverages a proven multi-party innovation framework and design thinking method to take participants through a lean and iterative process that connects concept development with experimentation and capability building for both participants and the sector as a whole. Drawing from an international support network, including a shared learning partnership with Canada's Evergreen, who are the founders of the Greater Toronto Area Housing Action Lab, the Queensland Housing Action Lab will dive deeper into local action with the benefit of global best practice, creating an environment to actually scale solutions, which will solve for problems surrounding the homelessness and at-risk older women issues we've been talking about today. The Queensland Housing Action Lab has been crafted to accelerate and build in COVID-19 recovery processes and support the development of that, that sector to recover in a post-COVID world. Structured and facilitated to ensure tangible and actual outcomes flow from the lab through co-investment and collaboration to ensure we mitigate the risks of failure and learnings that are exchanged both locally but also globally to foster and accelerate a more powerful network for Queensland. Ultimately, the Housing Action Lab will position Queensland as a leader both nationally and internationally. Let's hear from some of our lab advisors. If we can play the video, please. The individuals and agencies, we've really been slipping backwards in the provision of secure and affordable housing in Queensland now okay. for decades. It's quite industrialised, so it's been designed to uh, one size fits all. And I think the reality of of our lives and the diversity of our society and differing needs. Um, it deserves more than that and more than that is possible. As we enter a prolonged period of economic challenge here in Australia and internationally, housing our community will become increasingly complex both economically and from a human service point of view. We know this is not a solo effort. The HAL utilises an internationally proven engagement framework which brings together diverse actors to look at problems from new angles and vantage points. So when we're working with not-for-profit housing suppliers and developers and government side by side and academics and researchers, yeah. we can get a perspective that doesn't exist when you're working in your siloed approaches. And so the, the benefit really is that kind of collective action approach. And so we can find those points of alignment and drive forth um, areas where we have shared priorities and really begin to uh, nudge changes within our existing regimes. What excites me about the, the Housing Action Lab is the, is the potential to bring in new people and to find new ways and ways that are relevant to the times we live in and all the opportunities and challenges of today. It's the perfect response for housing in a time of COVID. So the Housing Action Lab is about being practical, boots on the ground, targeted, the supply and, financi and financing of affordable housing. Now this is where we're doers. Um, that's 
That's our mandate. The labs in general and the Housing Action Labs are a way to facilitate new thinking and new solutions. Without new thinking and new solutions, we can't make change. When better to redesign systems, relook at how we do things and gain traction um, and change for the better than now. The Queensland Housing Action Lab is an immersive three month journey the that Eastern begins here. As today, we are announcing the launch of the lab as part of the Lady Musgrove Trust 12th Annual Women in Homelessness Forum. The lab will steward industry-led solutions that tackle five key focus areas that have been identified, including homelessness, with a particular emphasis on how this affects older women, women new funding and operating models, loneliness and well-being, and housing affordability. For each of these focus areas, one foundation partner will guide the solutions path, with up to five general industry partners collaborating to achieve tangible and actionable results. We are now calling for leaders across industry, academia, and the Queensland Government with a point of view on how to improve or reimagine the housing sector to support us and join the lab. With those organisations that have already committed themselves, including incumbent leaders such as QCELTA, BHC, Urbis and Blue Chips, but also sector outliers such as Wiley & Co and Parks and Leisure Australia. And last slide. Now is the time to think big and take action to reset, reimagine and restart the Queensland housing and homelessness sector with the Housing Action Lab. Limited places are available, so we encourage you to jump online and register your interest to participate either as a founding partner or general industry partner, and we'll be in contact with you shortly. We look forward to discussing how together we can accelerate that journey through the Queensland Housing Action Lab. Thank you for your time. Thank Back you, Julie. Michael. Yeah, no, mm. fantastic. So all about collaboration, new thinking, um, and it's something that we can all be involved in. Like, I think people might go, oh, no, that's got nothing to do with me. But even what you were saying, Melissa, I mean, there are so mm. many industries that can come on board and even individual people that can help. And, um, and that's what you're doing. You're opening the doors to all of us. Yep. Yeah, fantastic. Thank Thanks. you. you well, balloons to come down from the ceiling. Confetti. It's a launch. It's, it's, it is a launch, yeah. And we want to see everyone on board. And as I said, you're hearing about it first here. So uh, that's great that you were able to join us. And now you can spread the word. And then when someone talks about it, Michael, they'll go, oh, I already know about that. That's old news. I was there for the launch. Fantastic. Now, um, we have been speaking about change. And thank you so much for all, take, all taking part of this forum a little differently to uh, what we would have done in the previous years. Um, I guess I'm going to take advantage of my knowledgeable crew I have right here now because I'm going to fire a question as we try and wrap up today's forum. Okay, COVID. We've spoken about COVID-19. We have to face it because it's in our face. Um, we can't live without it. And, and our, our Melbourne friends down there probably more so at present. But what has it done? Well, it's opened our eyes to many things that maybe we had blinkers on before. Um, we've, it, it gives us more value to things that we probably took for granted before. It's actually slowed us down. It's given us a bit more time. And we are looking at the world differently. So. Can you tell me, if you had a magic ball, because nothing is impossible in this world now, a magic ball, is there something you could restructure or rethink that you think, if we snapped our fingers, would help our older women at risk right this very moment? So think outside the square. Jeanette, do you want to have a go? <laughs> well, <laughs> I think uh, for me, it, it, look, it really does come down to gender inequality throughout a whole other woman's life. So. What I'd like to restructure actually is that um, women uh, are in higher paid positions, that they're not the casual workers and your part-time workers, who, you know, it's, it's the full impact of that that results in um, the older women's housing issue, the fact that they come to be older women with less savings, less superannuation. So, and I really think the COVID has actually highlighted that yeah. more than ever. Who yeah. has lost their jobs firsthand? It's mm. your casual workers, it's your part-time workers. And if you look at the statistics in Australia, if we're looking at your, your health and your community services sector, it's made up 70% of women. They're the lower paid jobs, education sector as well, lower paid jobs, uh, and 40% of those jobs are part-time and casual. Yeah. So that's what I'd like to restructure. Yeah. I'd really, you know, and it's not going to have the immediate impact that you're asking for, Lee, for older women in housing right and homelessness right now. 
but it will in the future if they yeah. really try and restructure that It's a domino thing. effect. It starts, you've got to start somewhere, don't we? Okay, panel. <laughs> so I, my, my view would be, uh, and I think we've learnt this from COVID, but governments, we all don't wait for the crisis to happen. So what we yeah. see now is too much of letting things go and triaging till we get to a point where we're responding to a crisis situation, that there needs to be a reinvestment in community and prevention. Yep. So preventing these things from happening becomes business as usual. Yeah, so proactive Do rather that. than reactive. Yes. Okay. Come on, Michael. I think doubling down on, on that ac action focus, really opening up some of the, the, the tools we have available to us as a, as a community and looking at that through both the resources and, and, and those things that we can build on, mm. but the redundancy that actually exists across infrastructure, across the, both yeah. human and physical resources and digital. Yeah. And I think if we take an experimentational prototyping approach and, and don't be fearful of just starting yeah. and trying something new, uh, and not having to plot our way through to an end result that we, we trick ourselves that we know yeah. the outcome around. It's actually starting and experimenting and prototyping at a speed that uh, is, is needing to be doubly, uh, doubled down with the digital effort. Well, you can see how things how things can go very fast when it has to. Yes. And we have all seen mm. that. So, exactly. yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, ladies, come on down the end, surely. Well, I think collectively we got here. So collectively, we've got to get out. Yep. Uh, so okay. that to me is about yep. partnerships, collaboration, absolutely um, engaging the private sector. They're not the evil other. They have an investment in getting a solution to uh, the problem. And I guess um, just for us all to keep at the back of our mind, Eleanor Roosevelt's wonderful quote, do something every day that scares you. Wow. So. <laughs> okay. You don't think we've had enough of that in just the general world at <laughs> no, present? <laughs> keep going with it. <laughs> Oh, look, I might try and slip into more supply and particularly more supply in the hybrids of home ownership, particularly during this time when there are good initiatives available and ways in which um, older women can also be helped into the over 50s housing suite, which currently isn't available. It sits there in total isolation. And my second one I'll slip in is never return to New Start. That we should be burying New Start very deep and okay. never going back there because it it accelerated this trend yep. of, of older women into homelessness. Okay, all right. Well, uh, thank you so much to my wonderful panel here. Now we've got to wrap things up. Uh, it has been a huge two hour forum. Actually, it went a little over. Um, but don't forget to book your masterclass, which we spoke about with the Handy Guide for Older Women. There's a masterclass for professionals. You go through the Lady Musgrave trust.org.au or if you are a woman in need or you think you know someone who could benefit from this, go on to thehandyguide.com.au and you'll see more about that. And that's becoming live, I believe, straight after this forum. Please fill out the survey. We have promoted that throughout the uh, morning, but it does mean a lot if you could just take a few moments and, uh, and fill it out because it will help us in the future. A big thank you to all our wonderful sponsors. I know they've been on screen throughout the forum, but to the Cromwell Property Group Foundation, Eastern Star, Queensland Government, Zonta and Keystone Private. We really could not be or have done this without you. So thank you. Our speakers, what a lineup we have had today and very diverse and all positive and we're all after the end goal, which is wonderful. So uh, a big thank you to the Honourable Dr. Kay Patterson. We had Charlotte Dillon, the Honourable Luke Howarth, the Honourable Mick Debrini. We've got Rachel Watson, Jennifer Clark joining me on the panel here. Uh, Maria Brenton, who, as I said, please go onto the website and have a look at that interview. It's amazing. Uh, Jeanette Large, thank you for all the way from Melbourne. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Professor Melissa Ball sitting right beside me here. And of course, uh, Michael Eels, thank you for being the, the rose between all the thorns here on our panel. We do appreciate that. Uh, of course, to the uh, working group, the 2019-2020 uh, forum working group to make this a success. There has been a lot of people working behind the scenes that you haven't seen. Please refer to the program to see the full team who've been involved today. A special thank you to Centre Care, Rosemary Pulgrain and Tony Janke. I'll, I'll skim through these. Uh, Queensland Health, Angela Martin, they're all very important, but we do want to give them a big shout out. Department of Housing and Public Works, Suzanne Robertson, Zonta, Susan Davis and the many other members for their support. And of course, getting this uh, handy guide out into the marketplace. And of course, the Lady Musgrave Trust, we have Mary Mealy and Jenny Clark, who's joining us. 
Can I tell you, this would not have happened if you could see behind the scenes here. We have got a cast of hundreds. Thank you to Lucid and the content division. Can we please give them amazing work? Fantastic. I think uh, this is going to take off. We'll be here yearly, guys, so just uh, get ready. We're moving in. Um, and also a lady off screen. Where is she? Karen, come on. Come on in here now. Karen Lyon-Reed. I mean, I don't know how long she's been uh, emailing me about things and updating and whatever, but can we put our hands together for this Please fill in the survey. That was what we did ask you. Uh, thank you all so very much for attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you next year. It is happening in August, but in what shape it takes, I don't know. So you're going to have to stay tuned for that. But thank you so much for joining us for the 12th Annual Forum. My name's Lee Muirhead. Thank you to all the panel. Thank you to everyone. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>